Um, just thought I'd check, can everyone hear me all right? Yep, cool, okay, awesome. Um, thank you, first of all, I want to say thank you to the SSI for um, inviting me today to chair this panel. Um, and I think it's really important that we um, shine a light on dis disability inclusion and a disability aw awareness agenda, basically, within not just research software engineering, but in the academic sector as a whole. So thank you for this opportunity to allow us to do this. Um, I'm just going to uh, just give a, a bit of scene setting um, just for people that maybe aren't so involved, for example, in a disability um, inclusion context in the sector, uh, just to show really the scale of some of the issues that we're facing. And then I will invite the panel to come and introduce themselves. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen, hopefully. Oh, it's <laughs> disabled. <laughs> If someone can allow me to share my screen, please. You've been made co-host now, so hopefully that yeah. works. Thank Sorry. you. Um, okay, let's go for that. Um, can does that work? Can everyone see this slide? Okay. Cool. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I should say that I'm. Rebecca Wilson, and I'm a research fellow in health informatics at the University of Liverpool, and I'm also a disabled researcher. I'm a wheelchair user. Um, so I just wanted to show this is a very busy take. This is just one slide to scene set the context of disability diversity in the academic sector. And I'm showing a table here um, that uh, basically it starts from the, the lowest pay grades within the academic research and teaching staff setting in UK higher education institutes, right through to the top level, which would be um, like the vice chancellor sort of level in, in an academic institute. And what we have is um, basically some statistics about the percentage of disabled and non-disabled staff uh, for the most recent uh, reporting year, which was the report compiled in 2020. So on average, um, across the academic re research and teaching staff, 4% of uh, staff are disabled or are disclosing, I would say, a disability. The bulk of disabled staff are at that postdoctoral research level. That's an over 50, just over 50% of the research staff uh, that, are just, that identify as being disabled are at the postdoctoral level. And basically, the higher up the uh, career ladder you go, I suppose, in academia, it's sort of just kind of flatlines. Um, you know, at the professorial grade, it's 3%. Uh, head of faculty grade, it's still around 3 or 4%. And again, at that vice chancellor level, uh, the percentage of disabled vice chancellors is around 3%. And so um, this sort of, um, I guess, a spread of, uh, of, of uh, dis disability at different uh, grades is very different to the picture that we see, uh, for example, for gender and for um, ethnicity. And there's a really strong disconnect between the diversity we have in uh, our teaching and research and academic staff and what is basically the most diverse undergraduates uh, that we've ever seen in, in, in academia, where almost 20% of our undergraduates disclose um, as identifying as being disabled. And so there's a real, there's very diverse undergraduates and we have this not so very diverse uh, research, teaching and academic staff. Um, that are <clears throat> basically uh, teaching and supervising these students. So that's the scene setting. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, uh, figure out how to do that. And I will now invite the panel members to just briefly introduce themselves. And I've also asked them each to provide uh, basically an example or an experience from their own disability perspective within their career. And so can I invite Phoenix up first, please? Thank you, Becca. Hello, I'm Phoenix Andrews or Phoenix CS Andrews when I'm feeling fancy. Um, my pronouns are they, them. It's transgender day of disability today. I know I'm not the only one in the meeting to be trans, so I thought it's important to say it. I have cerebral palsy, autism and ADHD. I would quite like a disability beginning with B just to kind of have an A, B and C of disability. It'd be quite fun. And my career stage is that I don't have a career. Um, no, that 
it, my PhD thesis is due in in 20 days. <laughs> so if I look mildly frazzled at any point when I'm speaking, that's why. Um, I've done lots of different jobs, though, so it's not like I mean, I'm quite old. I'm 40. I've done, I, you know, I didn't come into academia until quite late. I didn't do finish my degree until I was 28. No, started it when I was 28, 30, 31 when I finished my degree. Um, and I, I've worked throughout my degree, my master's and my PhD because I wasn't able to get funding because I didn't get a first in my first degree. Um, all of it to do with disability really some of them diagnosed some of them not diagnosed and not really getting support throughout I can't code by the way I can't do any research software engineering for you so I can't help on that um, <laughs> but the main barriers that I've come across um, so far in my career is sort of being punished effectively for not for, for uh, not having perfect grades and things and not completing my PhD within three years. And in jobs, generally speaking, either my, my reasonable adjustments not happening because they were inconvenient or stopping after about three to six months, by which time I'm supposed to have settled in. So things I'd asked for that seemed reasonable at the start. I didn't get because I couldn't have an office on my own, for example, because you're not allowed one if you're junior and therefore I couldn't have the lighting and other things that I asked for as a reasonable adjustment and things that I asked for like never calling a meeting for, with me without giving me the agenda in advance and telling me what we were going to talk about. People forget all of those <laughs> really, really quickly. And that's affected me actually massively in my work. It sounds minor, but it's not. Thank you, Phoenix, um, for sharing that with us. I will come back to you, actually, with I've got some good questions for you. There's also questions coming up on the slider as well. Um, I'm going to come to Ella next, please, to introduce yourself. Hi, morning, everybody. Um, so I was diagnosed as bipolar or manic depressive, you may have heard of, which is um, it's a depressive cis, uh, syndrome condition. Uh, some of the times you're very depressed, other times you have very high mood, which sounds awesome, but can actually be quite awful. Um, and my career level, I've, I've managed to get a lectureship. I've been in research for 10 years, um, bouncing between slightly different fields and different areas, and have finally managed to get a position teaching at the University of Bristol. And in, in terms of how disability has affected me, um, in my PhD, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who's done this, I worked far too hard. I was under a lot of pressure and I didn't know about my condition then. I got incredibly, incredibly depressed. Um, and to get to the end of my PhD, I, I was feeling suicidal was what I'm saying. So I changed everything. So I went from a Russell Group University to a formal polytechnic. I went from computational chemistry to straight computer science and changed everything about my research. And this helped. Um, I then discovered it took a while that actually it was the overwork, not the subject is why I've bounced between the two. But this career gap kind of affected the rest of my career because I'd moved from sort of, uh, I, I don't know, the highway. <laughs> um, and I'd taken a strange turn and was suddenly in a different field and had stepped, as I said, from Russell Group to Polytechnic. No one could quite understand why you would do that. And it's, it's taken me about 10 years to kind of get back to where I was. So that's that's a big way it's affected me in my career. Um, there's a couple of others, but I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Thank you, Ella. Um, next up, we've got Robin, please, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, yes, I'm Robin Wilson. <coughs> I often describe myself as a recovering academic. Um, I was an academic. Uh, I'm now a freelance software engineer, data scientist, RSE and various other things, whatever anyone will pay me for, basically. Um, I've got various disabilities, um, but about six or seven years ago, I was diagnosed with ME, uh, which is a fatiguing condition. Um, so I get very, very tired very quickly. Any physical exertion really exhausts me and I have to rest a lot. Um, I now use a wheelchair, not permanently, but for 
traveling any distances over about 30 meters so i can walk around in my house but i'll use my wheelchair for going down the road or down the shops or across a campus or, or whatever um there's been loads of examples of people in my academic career just not getting any of this at all um for example my university happily informed me when i was going to a, a conference after i started being a wheelchair user uh, that they wouldn't cover the insurance for my wheelchair while I was traveling internationally because it was a personal item of high value and therefore I shouldn't be taking it with me just like I shouldn't be wearing an expensive ring or expensive bit of jewelry when I go travel internationally. Um, I did manage to get that changed but it took a lot of fighting between the diversity office, the insurance office, the faculty office, the you name it. Um, also lots of things where universities don't seem to realize that they can have disabled staff as well as disabled students. And that's probably part of the reason why we've seen in these statistics that Becca just showed the, the real drop off. So for example, you can easily search for a lecture theater or seminar room to book, which is accessible for students in wheelchairs, but there was no way on the computer system to find one that's accessible for a lecturer in a wheelchair. So you've got a traditional lecture theater with steps down to the front. How do you find one way where you as a wheelchair user can actually get to the front? And the answer is you can't um, because they, they have no way of, of doing that because who would need to do that? Um, just one last thing, um, just to point out that may not come up later on. Um, as a wheelchair user, I think it's quite important for people to realize that for me, a wheelchair is a great enabler, not a limiter. People say, oh, it must be awful being in a wheelchair because you're so limited. A wheelchair enables me to do huge amounts of things that I could not do if I didn't have a wheelchair. When my wheelchair breaks and goes away for repair, I am extremely limited by the fact that I don't have a wheelchair. So actually, it's a great thing for me to have. Obviously, in an ideal world, I prefer that I didn't need it, but it's a great thing for me to have because it lets me access things far more than I would be able to without one. Thank you, Robin, for that. Um, I have to say that your words completely resonate with me as a fellow real wheelchair user. I completely agree. I would not be able to actually do my job if I didn't have my uh, wheelchair. And I am loving the term recovering academic as well. Um, I'm not at that stage yet for some reason. I'm still trying to pursue this as a career choice. Um, right. Next up, we've got uh, our final panelist, Robert, please. So thank, thank you, Becky, and uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm Robert Stevens. I'm a professor of computer science and a head of department for computer science at the University of Manchester. So one can say, well, really, it's all sort of worked for me. So I am blind. I lost my sight in my early 20s, having just started a PhD in biochemistry, you know, shifted sideways into computational biology and then computer science. And you know, my starting point for all of this is computers are just wonderful things. For as far as I'm concerned, being blind, they, they open up the world in a fantastic way. And just as I was doing my PhD, the web arrived and I could start looking at papers, having previously had to go to the library, photocopy papers and get them read onto tape, which by the way, is a great way of making friends. But, you know, in terms of, you know, barriers, I've really fallen on my feet all the way through my academic career. I went to York and there was someone there who did research on disability for visually disabled people, so knew about that world. He taught on the course and, you know, so there was acceptance there. I moved to Manchester and there's a bunch of people there who understood and knew things and so on and so forth. In terms of you know, general barriers, a lot of it in some ways is fairly low level. Um, I get into a rage fairly often about the inaccessibility of mandatory training material. 
Yes, I remember. I remember one of our earlier conversations about that, actually. Um, but, you know, in many, and, you know, sometimes, you know, getting hold of information is a bit of a fight. But people are very helpful and it sort of worked for me. But the interesting question is why? And that's where I'll leave it. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Robert. And uh, again, for everyone for sharing their experiences, uh, their personal experiences of disability. I I'm going to start with just a couple of questions that I've got, and then we are getting questions through on Slido, so I will um, read that some of those out. Um, so I was going to ask, uh, probably I will start with um, Robin, perhaps, uh, rather, because Robert has a very, you've got a very different perspective on this. But I was going to ask Robin, do you think that there's a higher barrier to entry in research software engineering um, for disabled people um, compared to, I guess, others coming into the uh, into the domain? I think there's a, yeah, for, for a lot of people with disabilities, there's a higher barrier to so many things just because um, of the of the the range of the range of issues they experience with with accessibility. So I, you know, just getting into a uh, a, a department or a research group at, at a university. When I was at, when I was at the university, you find that you can't you can barely get into the room, or there's you know, the only way to get there is to go halfway around the back of the building to try and get in the accessible entrance. And the sort of practical things like that. There's a lot of other stuff that I find about the problem with with developing your career is that lots of people with disabilities are extremely time limited because their disability. And managing it takes up extra time. So, for example, I have to rest quite a lot because of my ME. Um, I can't work at the breakneck pace that academia often wants you to work at. I can't be pushing out papers every five seconds because I need to rest or I'm going to make myself even more ill. Um, and that sort of just brings you down in the rankings of candidates and so on when you're applying for jobs because you aren't you don't come across as, as, as productive as, as you could. Um, and um, that makes it really difficult to even get a, a, a foot in the door, let alone get, get further, further in like that. Thanks for that. Um, I thought I'd ask um, Phoenix a similar sort of question, because you're obviously at the beginning of your research career, and I know you've said that you're not uh, a software engineer, but I was just wondering from uh, from your experience, do you think that there is that there is a higher barrier uh, to entry in research careers for disabled people? Yeah, absolutely, because everything about being a do, having a research career is about it's it's just so competitive that it's about being better and doing more than anybody else. And like Robin said, it's very hard to do more. And I already feel like I'm doing too much that I'm going to break myself um, and that you're sort of like a lot of people will say that you can be yourself in academia you can be more yourself and it's forgiving of eccentricities or whatever and I think that's true if you're quite high up or you're or it's true if that's the only thing that makes you diverge from being a cis het white man but it's not really true if you've got other intersections if you happen to be a person of color if you happen to be trans if you happen to be lesbian gay bisexual like if you happen to be older like there's it it's just it it's a massive barrier that intersects with other barriers for me and I feel like I'm constantly punished for not fitting the mold of what you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do. I, apart from anything else, because of my autism and ADHD, I've got publications and the fact that I've done loads of research jobs just to make a living. I've got publications in loads of different fields and I do have a coherent story I can tell about that, but it's not the same as somebody who's been taken onto the wing of a mentor and done things along the straight path and has been kind of blessed into being a research superstar. I think that resonates probably with Ella as well. I, I thought I'd bring you into this to see if you've got any further comments because for, just from your introductory uh, comments, um, you seem to have had a very similar sort of experience. Yes, um, so as I mentioned, I ended up moving around um, and having done it once, it was quite easy to skip across fields. Um, but you're right, Phoenix, there's a, a big problem in actually getting hiring committees to see that. Um, I applied for both lectureships in chemistry and computing 
and like disappointedly was told by chemistry oh you have tons of papers but you know they're all in computer science even though we want the intersection and then in computer science go we have tons of papers in computer science but the degree was in chemistry so um as for how i solved that basically i was lucky a new field came along called digital chemistry which they want all of the sort of ai ml stuff um, in computer science where i'd been working applied to chemistry and it feels like i just wafted around for about 10 years from lab to lab doing lots of useful work <laughs> until i happened to find that sort of the rest of the world caught up but um I was going to ask you um, a question, which was if there was one sort of revolutionary change that you would sort of suggest to facilitate, I don't know, um, career progression for disabled people, for example, in academia or research software engineering, what would you suggest? Okay. Um, I'd say this has to be a change at the university, um, but actually look at people's publication records in terms of time worked not years worked so if you had time off for sickness which i've done so you'd say you know i've had this many years of research um and if you're working part-time then that counts part-time if you take three months off because you're very depressed that doesn't count and then instead of comparing sort of level and age since uh, phd you're comparing people by how many years they've had in academia mm, that's a that's good point <laughs> Um, Robert, I was going to ask you a similar question because obviously you've made it, you are a professor, um, and um, I was going to ask you, you know, what, what revolutionary change would you like to see that could help address some of these issues? It, it's a hard one, you know, so I think um, given that you've asked about revolutionary and won, I think the see if I can articulate it properly, it's, it's for universities to just be much more brave uh, about accepting and, and, well, not accepting, but embracing diversity. Okay, and do, do we... Go for it, you know. Yeah, you have to pay, yeah. So do we, do we also, so uh, sort of like playing devil's ad advocate here as well, um, Obviously, the employer has a responsibility, but do we think funders and research funders also have a responsibility? Sorry, my screen reader just yeah, just spoke over you in a very rude fashion. Could you? Could yeah, you it, there was just an, sorry, there was an alert in Zoom, so it was probably reading that out. Um, I, I was I was going to say, obviously, employers have a responsibility, but do you think there's a role uh, uh, for funders? Do you think research funders should also? Um, perhaps are there some changes that they can make to facilitate, um, you know, resolving some of these issues? That's, that's a really difficult one, because I've read, you know, there's plenty of studies around that show, you know, if, you know, gender is revealed through, you know, names on papers or grant proposals, and you change the names between male names and female names, you get different outcomes. I don't know about disability. I mean, as far as I know, the EPSI has the EPSRC has no idea that I'm blind. Mm, okay. So I don't really know the answer to that one. I, I was just going to open it to any anyone else on the panel, um, whether they've got any comments uh, either for suggestions for in, in either for organisations or for um, funders that could perhaps help facilitate uh, changing this environment <laughs> that we're currently working in. Um, One thing I would say is that I think it's very important for funders and institutions to work out who's going to be responsible for what. And so much of the time as a disabled person, you're setting you're basically moderating a fight between the funder, the institution, some sort of government agency like the Department for Work and Pensions, who might provide something like access to work, um, and your individual supervisors, and you're sort of stuck in the middle of this trying to get everyone to work out whose responsibility it actually is to sort your problems. 
um, I mean, not to sort all my, all my problems in the grand scheme of things, but to, you know, to, to deal with, to provide funding for this particular accessibility issue or to, or to agree to this or whatever. Um, and that just takes time that I, I haven't got and energy that I haven't got. And so if there was a clear definition and an agreement between the funders and the institutions, either generally or, or when you know, a particular person takes up a job, we, you know, we are responsible for this, you are responsible for that, that would make things so much easier. I've got a funder one and an organisation one. Mm. So um, organisation wise, um, everybody who's got a disability gets an extra thing from uh, occupational health when they when they get offered a job where they have to fill in the questionnaire. And if you say everyone's filling the questionnaire, but if you say like yes to anything, if you're disabled, you suddenly get like an 80 page questionnaire. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to fill in the things and then you have to and then on top of that you have to tell them all of your reasonable adjustments and it can be very difficult if you've never done that job before to know what your reasonable adjustments are or to know which of the adjustments you'd like are reasonable for example if you're going to be expected to hot desk you can't ask to have a desk next to a window or to have your own personal light and all that kind of stuff so I think that organizations should keep a list of all of the reasonable adjustments that have been asked for and they've granted so that you can just tick those if they apply to and then add other ones if they don't and for funders I think they need to be less rigid when it comes to disabled people applying for things so there's some adjustments made around you know part-time not being the same you know part-time and full-time equivalents so you know if it's so many years after a thing but you're part-time then that'll be worked out as a you know accordingly but it's it's not just that it's have it's releasing um short short dates on funding calls that then punish disabled people who can't respond to them quickly it's having things that only let you apply for them once in your whole career but it could hit a patch when if you've got a chronic illness that would be really really difficult and it kiboshes your application and just things like graduation date like I'm ineligible for lots of schemes because my viva date is June and that's because I've had to bump lots of things along during my PhD and not finished when I was meant to finish because of disability um and so it means I'm basically going to have to have a whole year where I'm not employable and I'm not eligible for any funding. It just seems particularly cruel on disabled people who have fewer other sources of funding and can do fewer other jobs and can't be as mobile for jobs as well to have also have that kick in the teeth that they're not eligible for anything. Thank you for that, Phoenix. I think that's a really important point, actually, that you raised about mobility and the the sort of, it might not be physical mobility, but a lot of us have um, support networks that perhaps we can't leave to move to a different city or different country at the drop of a hat in order to pursue a career or a job um, that, you know, we might want to pursue. Um, I was gonna now actually open up some questions. Uh, sorry, unless Ella, you've got any <laughs> anything else that you want to say. I can't remember if I came to you on that last one. Um, um, I mean, only, um a couple more grants available for people with disabilities or who aren't standard um, like cis white het researchers. Um, I know there are some, um, but there aren't that many. So I know there's a Royal Society one, whether that's quite appropriate um, for this field, I don't know, but there could be some more room for those sorts of grants and part-time work, which I think was already mentioned. So yeah. I think that's actually a really important point because um, I've been sort of every time I give a talk around uh, disability inclusion, I always make the point that, you know, we have these women in science fellowships, we have um, BAME fellowships or professorships, there are no disability fellowships. The closest thing is the one that um, Ella just pointed out, which was the um, the Royal Society, it's like a, I can't remember what it's called, it's like a diversity fellowship, so it's for people that need the flexibility to work part time. But the salary point on that fellowship is at the very, very, very junior career level. There's like an upper limit on um, on the salary part that you can you can actually claim for that. And so when you're if you if you've been a, a disabled postdoctoral researcher and you've got to the top of your pay grade and you're looking for a fellowship that can be flexible enough to support you, um, you have to compete with the rest of the pool, basically, unfortunately, despite um, all, all, all this other sort of stuff. So, yeah. Um, right, so I'm going to start taking some questions from Slido. I don't know if any of you guys have got it up, but um, there was a, there's some really good questions in here. Um, there's a question uh, where someone has asked, what counts as a disability? 
for example, if you have a mental health condition, but you are functioning well, um, should you or would you disclose this to your employer? And Ella, because <laughs> you're on my screen right now, I thought I would pass this question to you. Um, so yeah, it depends really. Um, yes, I for a long time went, don't really didn't think of myself as disabled because once I got a diagnosis, uh, the proper drug support and a support network, um, and decided to stay where I am to use that, everything got a lot easier. Um, on the other hand, it has affected my career and sometimes will affect it. So I consider it, it is a, something that is worth expert telling um, employers about. And uh, I think it depends. It's a good idea. Well, generally, when you fill in the form when you start a job, you, you will probably put it down. But that doesn't mean anyone at the university you interact with actually knows. Um, it's a good idea to tell your supervisor or your boss, but I've had career, jobs where I haven't, um, and that's backfired. Um, there, was, there was one job where I failed to get follow-on funding and um, had uh, the head of research at the school tell me that my face didn't fit in the department, and because of my, my mental health issues, and I was like, you, you can't say that, that's that's a protected characteristic you can't do anything um to discriminate in that way but that has happened um but on the other hand i think the world's changing um i actually had sort of almost admitted in the last interview i did for a job that i got that i had these this experience um and that was a positive because a lot of students are having mental health problems now so to be able to say i i've been there and i can talk to students has been helpful so i'd, I'd encourage you to reveal once you've started the job if you fit uh if you have a mentor or a boss that you feel would would be understanding um it's kind of a play it by ear if you're at the junior level i feel okay thank thanks for that ella i, I don't know if anyone else on the panel has any, has any other advice around um disclosing uh, disclosing disability um to the employer yes um i mean like Ella says, then you sort of disclose it at the beginning and then nothing happens until it happens because you're in crisis. Um, but I think the hardest thing, and I've said this to students as well about disclosure, particularly around autism and ADHD is that, and anxiety, is that it's not just disclosing that you have it, it's explaining what it means for you in a way that they understand because lots of people kind of go, oh yeah, you've got whatever, and then they don't really get it. So they can either use it to kind of dismiss you and go, oh, that person won't be able to do this thing because they've got this condition or they don't really understand it. Or they don't get that you can have good days and bad days, that some days you will be able to do such and such a thing and other days you can't do that thing. So it, it's about having a, a way to be able to sort of handily packaged, explain to them what it means for you in this context and how they can support you. And that's a much more difficult conversation to have that we probably need to have some more support with that we don't get from say occupational health which is much more about how you do your job on a day-to-day -day level okay thank you um i was going to ask robert actually from the perspective of um someone who obviously uh, is head of a research group uh, i was going to ask you about your experiences of you know what are the kinds of things that perhaps as head of a research group or if you're a line manager uh, what are the, you know, what kind of advice would you give to other line managers around um, perhaps uh, supporting disabled staff or encouraging uh, that disclosure of disability in the first place? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really hard one. I mean, it's a long time since I really applied for a job, um, but I always did disclose that I was, well, am blind. Um, after my, when I was applying for postdoc, my second postdoc, round of postdocs, I applied, you know, all over the place and got only one interview, which was my place at Manchester. Was that because I was blind? I, I have no idea. Uh, it, it might have been. So, but in general, talk, talking to line managers, interview panels, 
a lot of it goes back to how we're we're we're, we're advised these days to try and manage unconscious bias or even indeed conscious bias i guess that don't be suspicious of your first thoughts you know try and think slow rather than fast think about why you've made a decision and i think some of the other panelists have already said this don't assume that your understanding of somebody else's disability is correct I obviously cannot see, but and saying, oh, I don't think I could do do this job if I couldn't see. But but you don't know what it's like not to be able to see. That's some very sound advice, I think, Robert. <laughs> that is. <laughs> I mean, it is a hard one, mm. but you know, trying to get people to seek advice, other people's experience. You know, I've got a, a line manager who's got blah. You know, how should I approach this? Okay. You know, we, we work at universities, we're supposed to go and find things out. <laughs> yeah, but I, I have a related sort of question, which actually I'll, I'll start with, with your response on as well, which has come in from the, um, the Slido. Uh, it's around sort of like, uh, I guess, the metrics that we use, the success measures we use in academia. And I guess, uh, do you have any ideas around how we can make perhaps those more inclusive to encourage, you know, to encourage and enhance the career progression of uh, disabled researchers. So, going back to my opening statement, you know, personally, the metrics that are used in um, academia have always just matched what I've wanted to do anyway. So it all pans out for me. Um, making adjustments so one thing i always say to you know recruitment panels is you've got to be deeply suspicious of things like bibliometrics you know they're just fraught with errors you know sorry not errors but uh but caveats where where i work now things like you know promotions forms and so on now have a little box where you can talk about you know things that might have affected your career you know parental leave caring responsibilities disabilities you know so on and so forth and you know we do take them into account so you can moderate these things I think funders, it's much more difficult, or, or not more difficult. But the, the, there's there's less opportunity. Do you, you know why is there why is there a gap in your track record? Why have you done this? Why have you done that? Um, but we should be trying to take these things into account. But actually, yeah, how you know uh, how do you quantify these things and anyone who sat on an examinations board or a mitigating circumstances committee you're faced with this all the time how much is a broken leg worth okay. is it worth more than you know a bereavement in terms of mitigation no one knows I think it's, it's I think it's a very 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 complex issue and I think that it's something that unfortunately we don't have time <laughs> to fully explore um, some of the suggestions around how to account for disability for example impacting a career during those things but um, I, I agree with what you're saying that um, we are starting to see in promotions um, applications and progression applications in universities there is a, a space or a disclosure statement where you can write in the things that have impacted your career to date and so that's encouraging. Um, we've only got five minutes left, and so what I wanted to do was just uh, I take it in turns to ask everyone. Um, I'm going to start with Robin, <laughs> to give you some warning, um, to just basically pick up on perhaps one thing that people here today attending this panel can take away with them back to their organisation or in their work that will, um, you know, help 
uh, improve disability inclusion either in research, research software engineering or in the in academic research generally so I'll ask Robin for your thoughts yeah so I think the biggest thing is about workload for me um, I think it's one of those things that that will improve things for everybody uh, trying to get sensible workload sensible work life balance and, and so on that has a disproportionately positive effect on people who are disabled, who have caring responsibilities, who are parents, all sorts of people who, who might struggle with workload. There's a huge number of people who, who that can really help. And just having a sensible expectation that you're not expecting people are going to be working 20 hours a day, all day, every day, including weekends and holidays, you, bringing some sort of sensible work-life balance into it. The other thing I would say is also asking people what they want or what they need and just believing the answers. If they say they can't do something, don't go into the whole, why can't you do it? Someone else with that condition can do it. You could do it yesterday. You could do it last week. What's changed? Why? Just, you know, if they can't say they can't do it, they can't do it. If they say they need this support, they, you, they're the experts in their condition. They live with it day in, day out. They know themselves. Um, and that's one of the big problems I found with, with, with work, with my variable condition. You know, there are some days when I can walk further than other days. There are some days where I need to work from bed. There are some days where I can be out running a quiz at the collaborations workshop and seem completely, you know, no problems whatsoever. You know, it, things vary. And that, um, you know, that, that's something that needs to be taken into account and needs to be believed when you say what you can and can't do that day. Thank you. So it's that fostering and providing really supportive environment, right, for your staff or for your colleagues that, that happen to be um, disabled. Um, I was going to come to Ella next, please, if you've got just yeah. one thing for people, one piece of advice for everyone. Um, flexibility and understanding. So I'm picking up on a very similar thing, but for people with mental health issues, there are some days I call them white days, or people have called them black days, I don't know why, where you just cannot do anything. You can't even get yourself out of bed. Um, and in the area of writing software, it's not necessary to feel pressured to be in at nine o'clock, working till five every day. So not having that pressure, being able to say sometimes today, I just can't do any work and that be okay. That, that was the big thing. And of course, like all disabled uh, adjustments, it also helps people without disability to be able to take a day off with very short notice as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, and I'll come to Phoenix next, please. <laughs> yes. So I have two, which is slightly cheeky. So but I'll be very quick. One of them is listen more and look for technical and policy solutions to things less. There is no tick box thing that you can solve accessibility with whatever your levers are it's about like robin says listening to people and believing them and the other one is i don't want to use the word mentoring because it's all a bit formal and horrible but we all know that academia and software development and government and all of the fields that people are here representing today um they work on patronage whether people want to admit it or not so be the person who who brings along and supports people who are not like you rather than the people who remind you of you at an earlier stage in your career. It's very easy to kind of go, oh, this person's amazing. I'm going to big them up because they're just like I was 10 years ago. Whereas actually you should just find the awkward people and the people who are struggling and bring them along instead. Thank you for that, Phoenix. And I'll, I'll just finish with Robert, just if you've got any final words of wisdom for uh, the attendees here today? So I, I think, you know, picking up very much on what Robin said, and as someone who dishes out workload in the university department, there's too much to do. And it's, it, you know, less work would be good for everybody. And the listening, as well as asking, you've got to listen. But my final thing that I don't think anybody says, but I think it might pick up on the last point, is a bit of humility won't go amiss. You know, actually understanding um, more and, you know, that, that, that lack of... Uh, everybody must be in my image. Thank you for that, Robert. Um, 
So I, I'm aware that we are out of time, unfortunately, um, but there's a couple of things just I would like to uh, end with, which is that, first of all, thank you so much to everyone on the panel for sharing their own personal experiences around disability. Um, obviously, some of us, most of us are around. Um, I've started a Slack channel called EDI Chat. Um, so if you've got some questions or comments and things, maybe go there. Um, and I am going to try and answer some of these uh, Slido questions in Slido because we haven't actually answered, we didn't get around to answering them all because I think that um, we could probably talk all day about this, these sorts of issues, I think. <laughs> so I shall uh, sign off for now and pass over back to Rachel, I guess. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. Can we have a, a virtual round of applause for our panel, please? Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us.